This is going to be 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to talk about the subject of what to do when you don't know what to preach. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Many times a man says, I can't think of what to preach. And this is a strange thing because if you are to preach what thus saith the Lord, then you need to do like Paul tells Timothy, and that is to preach the word. If you need to preach the word, then there's plenty of it. 66 books of the Bible with more than one application. You can go doctrinal, practical, historical. There is so much word to preach that if you preached every day, three times a day, you could preach something different every time. But if you preach the word, what could you preach? That's what we're going to look at. Number one, if you preach the word, you could preach prophecy. 2 Timothy 4.1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. So what Paul just told you there in verse 1 is going to come to pass as sure as you are in this world. God is going to judge the quick and the dead. He's going to judge the born-again believers at the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to judge everyone else at the great white throne. So Jesus Christ is going to appear in the clouds to the church, and we will meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So he's going to appear to us in the clouds, to the church. And after about seven years of tribulation and wrath, he is going to appear where every man shall see him in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And it says in Revelation 1-7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. That's when he is bringing in his kingdom. And then Revelation eleven fifteen says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That is when he has come to set up his kingdom, and he's going to reign a thousand years. There is so much prophecy to preach if you preach the word. And the Lord will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He's going to judge the saints at the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to judge people at the judgment of the nations that you can read about in Matthew 25 where he will separate the sheep from the goats. He's going to judge the quick and the dead. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Next, when you don't know what to preach, preach the word and you can preach by persuading people. That is what preaching is, persuading someone to make a decision about something. So persuade someone to do something. And all you have to do is be instant in season, out of season. That is when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. You reprove. When you do this, you tell someone's fault or their sin to their face, letting them know that they need to correct it. And then a rebuke is a little more severe. Letting someone know when they're wrong is how you can help them get things corrected. And many times people today don't have the discernment to know something is wrong. And then the verse said, exhort. When you do this, you're getting someone excited about doing something. Exhort people to read the words of God. Exhort them to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Exhort them to make the right decision. And it says you do this with all long-suffering and doctrine. Long-suffering because not everyone is going to catch on to things right away. Not everyone is going to make a change right away. Not everyone is going to do what you're exhorting them to do right away. And doctrine, because that is what makes the Bible come alive. That is what is lacking in preaching today. They spend most of the time on practical things. The milk of the word, and, and they are lacking the doctrine. 
And that's how a Christian grows, is hearing doctrine. That is how they get interested in the Bible, is by hearing the doctrines of the Bible. Today, the popular preachers spend very, very little time on doctrine. It's more about having a good sermon. Half the sermons you listen to by the most popular preachers today are about the same few subjects. About how God is going to get them through everything, which He is, and how we need revival, which we do, or God's going to take care of you, which He will, but they spend all of their time on very few subjects because it's what people want to hear. And all these things are true, but you hardly ever, ever hear a good doctrinal sermon by the most popular preachers today. It's more about entertainment. And they think like this stuff that I'm saying right now is boring. And I may be kind of a boring uh, person to listen to, but at least I'm giving you some doctrine. Uh, you got to watch out for always wanting to be entertained all the time. But there are the, the most popular preachers today, the primary focus is on music. And and then it's a it's a very milky sermon with not much doctrine. And that's why Christians don't know anything today is because the preachers and teachers today are lacking doctrinal teaching. And then also in verse 3 in 2 Timothy 4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So they won't endure sound doctrine. Doctrine divides. Doctrine shows you what a man really believes, and people don't like for you to not believe what they believe. You have men today who just say what people want to hear. People have itching ears. They want someone to say things to scratch their itch, that they have in their ears. So if you don't know what to preach, a third thing you can preach is against the posers. The men who forsake doctrines like hell, they don't talk about the wrath of God, they don't talk about sin, and all the negative doctrines of the Bible. They are posers. Second Peter 2, 1 through 3 says, But there were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Many men are making millions of dollars by using the name of Jesus Christ. This is because the love of money is the root of all evil. They are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God because these men are lovers of their own self. And Philippians 3, 18 and 19 says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. These are enemies of the cross. These are false teachers and false prophets whose God is their belly. They love money more than they love you. They love money more than they love God. These are the posers that you can preach against. Maybe even name names. If you don't know what to preach then preach against these wolves in sheep's clothing. Even though the old preacher said, if you do this, you'll be a sheep in wolf's clothing. You'll be the loving preacher of the gospel, but the average Christian is so worldly that they'll think you're the wolf because they think a good Christian man is supposed to be just always sweet and gentle and just put up with everything is what they think. But there are deceivers. These evil men and seducers who act worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And verse 4 says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. And Jesus was always saying, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. But people are turning away their ears from the truth. Today in the last days, men have turned off their ears. They have their Beats headphones and their AirPods, which is okay if you're listening to the right thing. But they're listening to the world. And they're not interested in the Bible. But if they are interested in the Bible at all, they're listening to not biblical preaching, but they're listening to the posers. They're being turned into fables.
turned on to fables. What's a fable? Uh, evolution would be a fable. The doctrine of no hell is a fable. Because there is a literal burning hell. Uh, Calvinism is a fable. Ultra grace is a fable. Many men teach that since you're saved, you should just live how you want to live. That's a fable. Just because you're saved by grace doesn't mean you should abuse the grace of God. So preach against the posers and preach about persecution. Some men are teaching that you will have your best life now. If you give them all your money, then God's going to give you a whole bunch of money back. Or that you should be prospering financially. But someone who is really preaching the Bible knows that all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And a Bible believer knows that Jesus didn't have anywhere to lay his head. A Bible believer knows that Paul received 40 stripes save one. A Bible believer knows that Stephen was stoned to death. Uh, that Antipas was against everything and ended up being a faithful martyr. They definitely weren't living their best life now. They definitely weren't. And if you're preaching right and teaching right, then you'll teach we are in a war. And war isn't easy. And you're going to teach that you're going to be attacked from all sides, from the flesh, the world, the brethren, the devil, the Illuminati, the music industry, Hollywood. You're going to teach these things. And verse 5 says, But what's thou in all things? Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Endure afflictions, it says. You're going to face some persecution. You're going to face some afflictions. That's why Paul says, Endure hardness. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Do the work of an evangelist. And that doesn't just mean someone who goes around to churches every day preaching. And staying in fancy hotels and things like that. Preaching to mostly saved people. You can be an evangelist by preaching the gospel to every creature you come in contact with. And uh, this, isn't all, this isn't something that's pretty. You could face persecution. Because many people don't want to receive the gospel. And you're not going to get any credit for it, most likely. The average person that goes around telling people how to be saved all the time isn't some big name, big shot. You may get spit in the face. You may get yelled at. You may get a door slammed in your face. But it says in verse 5, But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. So make full proof of thy ministry. And verse 6 says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. So Paul's life was coming to an end for the gospel's sake. And if you're preaching right, then you'll preach some men will die for the faith. Some men will die because they preach and teach Jesus Christ. God loves his children, but you'll see examples in the Bible and throughout history where born-again believers go through pain, sorrow, torture, and death. They weren't living their best life now. They weren't prospering financially. They were poor and getting their head chopped off. Paul lived his life as a walking sacrifice for the Lord. And he says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The least you can do is, is be a living sacrifice for God. Paul was a man who wasn't afraid of death. He had already been caught up to the third heaven and come back. Only he couldn't tell people what he saw. He saw unspeakable things which is not lawful for him to utter. So he knew what was waiting for him on the other side. And that's why he said in Philippians 1, 21 through 24, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I won't not. For I am a straight betwixt two, having a desire to be to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. I bet you couldn't scare Paul. I bet he was so unafraid of man that you could put Goliath, the maniac of Gadar, the two lion-like men of Moab, the lions from the lion's den, in the midst of a pit on a snowy day with Paul, and Paul wouldn't even flinch. He would probably say, Thank you, Lord. I'm so ready to get out of here. Just let these people kill me, is what he would probably say. But Paul knew that he wasn't going to live his best life now. He knew that there was a better life hereafter. 
And we should all desire to be that way. Paul didn't have the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The coronavirus wouldn't have stopped his missionary journeys. He knew that as soon as he closed his eyes in death, he would wake up on the other side. And that song says, I'm already over on the other side, waiting on my brand new body. And that's what Paul knew. That's so true. In Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, it says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm already there in Jesus, waiting on my body to be. We're waiting on our brand new body. We're waiting for the redemption of our body. Paul was now ready to be offered. The time of his departure was at hand. And notice at the end of this letter it says, written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. So Paul was about to lose his head as a martyr. Literally sticking his neck out for the gospel's sake, he was facing persecution. And if you don't know what to preach, then preach about coming persecution because it is coming. And if you're preaching right, you'll tell people the truth that everything is not always okay. Trouble is coming. Times of tribulation could come on you before the rapture. Even though we're not going through the time of Jacob's trouble, we may not be going through the beginning of sorrows or the following great tribulation, but God's people have always seen tribulation and they're seeing it today, even if it's not in this country quite yet. Paul said in verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So Paul went through all types of persecution, pain and sorrow, disappointment, but he kept the faith. He finished his course, and that is he made it to the end of his life serving God and didn't sell out. He fought a good fight. He fought with beasts at Ephesus. As it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, in Ephesians 6, he talks about wrestling against principalities and powers. He fought thorns in the flesh which are people sent from Satan to drive you crazy. But through all that, he says he kept the faith. He didn't listen to the satanic ministers who told him you have to believe on Jesus Christ and be circumcised to be saved. He knew that salvation was by believing on Jesus Christ, and that's it. He didn't listen to men who said the resurrection was past already. He kept the faith. He kept what God had already shown him in the Bible, and he kept what revelation the Lord had already gave directly to him. Now verse 8, he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Times may be hard here, but if you believe and preach prophecy, then you know you have a crown waiting for you in the future if you love his appearing. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So you can earn yourself some crowns that you'll get at the judgment seat of Christ. And these are incorruptible crowns, as Paul calls them. 1 Corinthians 9.25 And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible so this crown in 1 Corinthians 9.25 is a crown for keeping your body in subjection. And it is an incorruptible crown. Here in 2 Timothy 4, this crown of righteousness is given to those who love his appearing. In 1 Peter 5.1-4, through 4, you have another crown that's mentioned. In 1 Peter 5.1-4, through 4, it says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Notice that not for filthy lucre. That's what the posers feed the flock for. They, But they don't really feed them. But anything they do for the Lord is for filthy lucre. So they're really doing it for their self, just claiming to be doing it for the Lord. But verse 3 says, Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So here a person can get a crown for feeding the flock with the word of God and being in samples. And of course, it has to be with the right motive and not for filthy lucre. 
You can also get a crown for enduring temptation. In James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So the Bible also talks about a crown for winning souls. 1 Thessalonians 2.19-20 says, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. And there is an interesting verse in Job that hints at a crown for being a faithful Bible believer. In Job 31, 35 through 36, it says, Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. So there is another interesting verse in Proverbs that shows us about another crown. Proverbs 17, 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. So it looks like if a person raises their kids right and trains them up in the way they should go, then they could end up earning them a crown. Children's children are the crown of old men. So here you have crowns you can get at the judgment seat of Christ. So preach about persecution and then you can preach about this present evil world in 2 Timothy 4 9 through 10 it says do thy diligence to come shortly unto me for Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present evil world or this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica Cretans to Del Galatia Titus unto Dalmatia Galatians 1 4 says, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. So if Paul called the world evil back then, then what would he think of America in 2020? Can you even believe we are in 2020? On those Back to the Future movies that everybody watched as a kid, when they went into the future, I think they only went to like 2015 or something like that. But the world is wicked in 2020. And Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And as I read in Galatians, he called it this present evil world. The world is doing all it can to attract your eyes, your ears, and all the rest of your senses. It tries to impress you with nice clothes, nice cars, nice buildings, flashy lights, and decorations. These are just temporary things. But they must have attracted Demas. And you can see in Colossians that Demas was once all in with Paul. In Colossians 4.14 it says, Luke the beloved physician and Demas greet you. But then something happened. I'm not sure what happened, but it all comes down to the fact that he forgot about the subject of temporal versus eternal. And 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, while we, not, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The things that you can't see actually look better than all these nice things that you can see. And even though you can't see them, the Lord gives you some descriptions of some of them if you read the Bible. And a good preacher will preach against the world and exalt a better country. Hebrews 11:16 says, But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. There are more people that would like to go to this country than they would Sodomite America. If that is, if they are Christian people that have their affections set on things above, then there should be Christians out there who desire a better country than they do Sodomite America. Hebrews 11:16 is really God's country. And it's not Georgia or California or Las Vegas or any place on earth that men like to go to. They have that wicked song out called God's Country that plays everywhere talking about how Georgia or some place is God's country. And they say the devil went down to Georgia, but he didn't stick around. But it actually, it sure looks like he did stick around. I hear about people getting shot down there all the time. And I'm not that far away from it. And then in that old song that they referred to where the, the guy named Johnny really beat the devil in a 
in some type of fiddling match. But really, if you think about it, Johnny really lost to the devil in that song. He just didn't know it. Because he lost when he put his soul on the line in the fiddling match. Uh, country music is some of the most godless nonsense that you'll ever come across. Pretty much every song on the radio talks about drinking and fornication. You know why? That's because we're in a present evil world. And if I never hear a country song again, I'll be very happy. But living in the South, it's probably pretty far-fetched for me to have that kind of hope. But 2 Timothy 4.11 says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. In this present evil world, you'll still have some friends. Paul had Luke, a beloved physician, traveling with him. Luke wrote Acts, and in the book of Acts, you hear Luke saying, We, referring to him and Paul, because they were traveling together. In this present evil world, you'll have some friends. Some friends like Demas forsake you and don't come back. And then friends like Mark, who you have a falling out with, but end up coming back and working with you again. You see, Mark had a falling out with Paul. In Acts 15, 37 through 39, it says, And Barnabas determined to take with me them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, and who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, that they departed asunder from one from the other, one from the others. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. So the contention was sharp between Paul and Mark. But now Paul says, Mark is profitable to me for the ministry. It's a present evil world, so there is no sense in splitting up and holding grudges with the few people that are like you. Second Timothy four twelve and thirteen says, And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. So in this present evil world, you have to look out for each other. Timothy was going to bring Paul's cloak to him. It's about to be winter time, and Timothy wasn't going to leave him out in the cold. Verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. So here you have another poser. Paul wants to him to get rewarded according to his works, and this reward won't be a good thing. As it says in Deuteronomy 32, 41, the Lord said, If I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and will reward them that hate me. So being rewarded by God isn't always a good thing. So this guy did something so bad to Paul and he was going to let the Lord put get vengeance on him. In this present evil world, you'll have thorns in the flesh. And that was Alexander the coppersmith, enemies to the gospel. Tell the Lord to reward them according to their works. This guy, Alexander, like many others, will try to shipwreck the faith. And then Paul also delivered him to Satan. 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So this could be someone in your life who, when you're witnessing to someone, they want to butt in and argue about doctrine, trying to subvert the hearer of the gospel. But verse 15, it says, Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. You have men in this world who, instead of getting people saved or helping someone get saved, actually fight against you trying to get a person saved. It's like some men work against you. They don't help you work. It's almost like they work on the opposite side. Even though they say they're on your side, they make it harder to get the work done. Not only do they, they don't do their part, but they get in the way of you doing your part. And if you're being withstood by someone, then they are opposing you or resisting you. And in Acts 13, Elimus the sorcerer withstood God's men and tried to draw away Sargius Paulus from the faith. And Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. The devil always has men trying to withstand God's men. And Alexander the coppersmith was one of them. He greatly withstood Paul's words. And by doing this, he was actually going against God's words. And not just Paul's, because Paul was sent by God himself. And you have men today who want to have the preeminent place. And in the Bible world, 
there are men who want to have the preeminent place in the you know the Christian world you see this so they attack and they fight and they mock and they slander and they are false accusers they do this to every Christian who they feel like is greater than they are because they they have they feel like they got to be the greatest and so they attack and slander they attack and slander everyone who doesn't agree with them now verse 16 at my first answer no man stood with me but all men forsook me i pray god that it may not be laid to their charge notwithstanding the lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the gentiles might hear and i was delivered out of the mouth of the lion you know the greatest thing that will make you be bold as a lion and without fear of man in this present evil world is if the Lord stands with you. If God be for you, who can be against you? He'll give you strength. Paul said his strength is made perfect in weakness. It seems the weaker you are, the stronger you are because you rely on the Lord more when you're in these hard situations. The more you rely on God, the stronger you become. The weaker you are, the more you rely on God. So it makes sense that the weaker you are, the more alive you are. He delivered Paul out of the mouth of the lion. He delivered many men from lions. Daniel in the lion's den. Benaiah was helped of the Lord to kill the two lion-like men of Moab and the lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. And Paul was delivered from the roaring lion who walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 2 Timothy 4.18 And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul went through so much in his ministry, enduring hardness as a good soldier, but you see the Lord delivered him from every evil work. He had messengers of Satan to buffet him, yet he was delivered. Notice it said the Lord preserved him. And there is your verse on eternal security. God is going to keep you saved just as sure as he keeps his words. God also promised to preserve his words. Since more friends... Some, uh, some more friends that Paul had in this present evil world were Priscilla and Aquila. You need, some find, you need to find some friends in this old sinful world that will stick with you. He says in verse 19, Salute Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. So Priscilla and Aquila shared the same occupation as Paul as you'll see in Acts 18, 1 through 3. They were both tent makers. Not only did this couple work with their hands, but they also knew the Bible very well. Many times a hard worker out in factories or wherever they may work, when they get saved and in the book, they will also be a great workman in the scriptures. They were common people who knew the book so well that they knew the book better than the mighty men of the scriptures of their day. And they were able to, to lead Apollos in the right direction. He was... A, a scholarly mighty man in the scriptures that they were able to lead the right way but they were just common people so paul had a lot to talk about with these this great christian couple they had the same craft and they they all loved the book so paul goes as far as to say in romans 16 3 that they were his helpers in christ jesus and in first corinthians 16 19 it talks about the church in their house so they were consistently meeting and getting into the book so he says in verse 19, Salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus was the man we talked about in 2 Timothy 1.16. He is the one that often refreshed Paul and wasn't ashamed of his chain. He wasn't ashamed that Paul had been in prison for the gospel. And many times this present evil world, people will want to go along with the world like Demas, but not Onesiphorus. Verse 20, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. We know that Paul had the gift of healing. He had the signs of an apostle. As he says in Acts 19, 11 through 12, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And then he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So why didn't Paul heal Trophimus? It seems to be because after the Jews rejected Jesus Christ and the Lord began dealing primarily with the Gentiles and the church, that the sign gifts were no longer needed. And that's because the Jews require a sign. As it says in 1 Corinthians 1.22, but when God goes back to dealing with Israel in the time of Jacob's trouble, the sign gifts will come back 
and will be around until that which is perfect is come. And that which is perfect is Jesus Christ at the second coming. Now verse 21 in 2 Timothy 4, Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. Paul is in a hurry for Timothy to get there because he knows he's about to die for the faith. And there were some people still ministering with Paul. Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren also send their greetings to Timothy. But verse 22 says, The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. The second epistle unto Timotheus, ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians, was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. So fellowship with Jesus Christ is the most important thing in your Christian life. He ministers to your spirit. So Paul says, The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. And Paul says, grace be with you, because grace is something we need every day. There is saving grace, and then there is grace the Lord gives us every day for every situation. But this has been 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I hope you'll get into it and study it for yourself too.